When we're eating the standard American diet, which over, I think it's 30%, uh, 36% of the calories coming from inflammatory fats, sugar, and processed foods that are very calorie dense, but nutrient poor. I saw a lot of bodybuilders and a lot of these CrossFit athletes get really sick and some of them even died from COVID because they were just so internally inflamed, even though they looked incredible on the outside. Yeah. You can't just judge a book by the cover. And then they start eating very, very healthy. Very often they don't have the bacteria that they need in their gut to break down and digest a lot of those healthy foods. But it's not the food that's the problem. It's typically the microbiome and where your gut is at based off of the diet that you've been eating before. What is healthy for each woman will of course vary based off of their body. I've known some women who can get to close to 16% body fat, no issues. As women, we have extra fat around our ovaries. We have extra fat around our breast tissue. And visually looking at this, a, a woman probably close to 16 or 18% is gonna look like a guy who's probably closer to like 10 to 12% visually. For men, they tend to store more of their fat around the midsection. And that fat around the midsection is actually what's the most metabolically unhealthy. Antibiotics will definitely wipe out a lot of the good bacteria in your gut. And where this can become problematic is because when we wipe out a lot of the good and some bad, sometimes bacteria, it can allow for other bacteria to overgrow. Do they go to the doctor, that's what we've been taught to do, and they feel like they're doing everything right. Eventually for me, I was even sent to a colorectal surgeon, just like you said earlier, where I was given the suggestion that I have my entire large intestine taken out because it actually came to a point where I couldn't go to the bathroom at all. Laxatives didn't even work for me and I had to actually do a daily enema to even get my body to empty, which is, yeah, I know, not sexy for, yeah. you know. How long, did you, how long did you have to do that for, the enemas? <laughs>
I gained the freshman 15, like us all, like a lot of us did. And I was in a sorority and partying and drinking, just not really doing a whole lot with my life, trying to figure it out at that age. Like we're all just trying to, you know, white knuckle our way and figure it out. And I found bodybuilding. And for me, you know, bodybuilding was at the time, one of the best things that ever happened to me for my physical and my mental health in a lot of ways. I saw my body shift and change in ways that I had never seen it before. It gave me a sense of empowerment through doing hard things. I was able to push my body to these extremes that I never thought I was capable of. And I fell in love with what it was doing for me mentally and physically. And I feel like a lot of us start our fitness journey from this place, right? We're like, you know what? I'm not really happy with where I'm at in my life. Sometimes we actually even dislike our body. We even sometimes hate where we're at. And, you know, for me at that point in my life, that's how I felt. I was a very insecure girl growing up. I was the girl in the back of the classroom who like would never really speak up, like raise my hand like this. If you guys are listening, it's like half raised, (laughs) Um, very uncommittal, very, very shy and bodybuilding and fitness gave me the sense of confidence that I didn't know that I could have. And I think that's what's so beautiful about fitness in, in general is it really helps us step into a more confident version of ourself. It really translates to other areas of our life. And I'm so grateful for getting into fitness, but I think also my viewpoint of health back then was skewed because it was just based off of the physical. I thought I was healthy if I had six pack abs and, you know, also bodybuilding at the core, it's, it's not healthy, right? Mm -hmm. You know, the people who are winning up on stage who are at 12% body fat, who are literally being judged for every little critique and things that could be wrong, quote unquote, in their body ends up winning. And a joke we used to always say in bodybuilding is usually the person who's winning is the most unhealthy person actually there mentally in a lot of ways, because you put so much of your, your worth in your physical body, which is actually what happened to me. And I'll, I'll get to that here in a little bit, but also just, what you're doing to your body physically. You know, I lost my menstrual cycle. I, I was overtraining in a lot of ways. I was under eating, you know, I was tracking every little morsel of of food and calories that I ate and I was winning. And that's, what's so ironic about it because sometimes we can be doing things that are on the outside praised actually publicly. We can be these publicly praised addictions and and feel like we're we're doing things that are great because people are like yeah that's awesome that's amazing and for some people i think it it can be done healthy at least i just know for me it it wasn't or at least it slowly started to not be even if it was at the beginning for me and as i started to get into the later stages of bodybuilding you know, 12% body fat, I started to actually struggle quite a bit with my health, you know, and I think I started to struggle a bit even before when when I say health, I mean more on the physical side there, but I started to struggle before even with my mental health. You know, I had a lot of anxiety and I was having trouble sleeping and just everything in my life was focused around fitness and bodybuilding. But what really, really shifted for me is I remember when I was competing actually at the national level, getting ready to go pro, I came home after I had just won like a first place trophy and I was so proud and just something felt so off internally. And my gut just was never the same after that. It was literally a moment in time. I remember where just things were different and I started to struggle with severe bloating and constipation and these terrible, terrible gut issues that literally would leave me in bed every single day, just depressed and unable to move. And I didn't have a menstrual cycle, like I said at the time, and just a lot of things started to become off physically with my body. So I did what most people would do. They were like, okay, there's something that's off. There's some physical signs. And I went to the doctor 
and they did all the scans, the MRI, CT, colonoscopy, endoscopy, right? Because they're like, okay, let's see what's going on with your gut. Blood work came back normal, except for my thyroid was a little bit low, which makes sense when you're in a very low calorie diet, low body composition, your thyroid slows down, it's a biofeedback, very, very normal. But gut-wise, everything was normal. <laughs> there was nothing wrong with me. So I was given a label of IBS or irritable bowel syndrome and given a bunch of medications. I was given laxatives because I could not use the restroom at all. Just how much the motility in my gut had came to a halt. I was put on thyroid medications because of my thyroid. Um, I was on birth control because of my hormones and I was starting to get acne and my, my hair was even thinning a bit. And I just continued to get worse and worse over the next year where I remember one day just literally lying in bed, just saying like, this isn't my life. This, this isn't real. Like this isn't happening. You know, my, my whole life up until this point was fitness and what I thought was health. And I felt betrayed by it. I, I felt completely betrayed by it, but I thought that for me was like my rock bottom and all these medications. And I thought I was doing what I was supposed to be doing. And I feel like that's what a lot of people do. They go to the doctor that that's what we've been taught to do. And they feel like they're doing everything right. And eventually for me, I was even sent to a colorectal surgeon, just like you said earlier, where I was given the suggestion that I have my entire large intestine taken out because mm -hmm it actually came to a point where I couldn't go to the bathroom at all. Laxatives didn't even work for me. And I had to actually do a daily enema to even get my body to empty, which is, yeah, I know not sexy for, yeah. you know, how long, you have, how long did you have to do that for the enemas? <sighs> Probably a good six months. And just, wow. I, was, I was absolutely miserable and I was ready to get the surgery. Like, like a lot of people were like, oh, then you just started really diving into like your health and your microbiome. I was like, no, no, no. I'm like, when can we schedule the surgery? Like, let, do it. I, I was that desperate with where I was at. So I know what it's like to be at that point in your life where you are just like, can I cuss on here? Yeah, <laughs> where you're ahead. just like, fuck it. Like, I'm sick and tired of feeling the way that I feel. I don't want to feel this anymore. Give me the pill. Give me the medication. Just cut out my large intestine. I just want to get on with my life. I, I know what it's like to be at that place. I can speak to that hmm. and people. But at that moment, I just had this inner knowing that there was another way. I had this knowing that, you know, I was going to heal. Like there was a way that I could heal. And even though I was like ready to schedule the surgery, I decided to give myself a few months and, you know, I just became obsessed with learning everything that I could about gut health and the microbiome and how the bacteria in our gut control everything in our entire body. And I started to really work on healing my gut, but more from a functional medicine and a holistic perspective, really getting to the root cause. And I found that a lot of my issues were actually stemming from a lot of bacterial overgrowth. I had SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, which was leading to a lot of the chronic bloating, the distension um, based off of the type of bacteria I had. It was slowing down the motility in, in my gut in conjunction with the fact that I had a very low metabolic rate at the time because of where my body composition was and my thyroid slowed down and the motility in my gut slowed down. And, you know, my all of these things were interconnected and Western medicine was really just looking at it from this approach of, you know, these random independent organs, what's off, what are the symptoms? And yeah, ruling out anything major, like they tried to rule out that I had ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease with, with the colonoscopy and endoscopy. But after all of that, they weren't really looking at how everything is interconnected. And nobody actually asked me about, hey, Rachel, what's your lifestyle? What's your stress? What's your sleep? And for anybody who's listening, if your doctor prescribes you medication without actually asking about your diet, exercise, or sleep, they're not actually trying to help you heal. They're really just a drug dealer. Mm -hmm. And I got fed up with the approach, but to bring this story full circle, because I said I was going to give high level and I didn't at all. But, you know, I ended up 
taking more of this functional holistic approach and it wasn't an overnight quick fix by any means. And I was a, really obsessed with my healing, but I learned a different way. I learned more of a root cause a root cause based approach. And it consisted of really two things. One, identifying what the root causes were, what, what is off of my body and how they were all interconnected. And that's why, you know, now with my functional medicine nutrition practice, which I created as a byproduct of all of this, we take a root cause and gut centric approach to healing, because very often when you heal the gut, everything does start to improve. But we also have to ask the question always, why did it become off in the first place? Yeah. And that is different for every single person. For me, it was the relationship that I had with myself. Yes, there are some things I was doing dietary wise that led to my gut being off, um, you know, probably under eating my gut lining breaking down is a byproduct of being in a very catabolic state, which sets the tone for bacterial overgrowth. My diet had some artificial sweeteners in there, like the bodybuilder type diet, but truly at the core, I had to really heal that relationship I had with myself. And it was when I started to really look at healing from a holistic whole person standpoint, I really started to see results and actually completely heal my body, which is why I always say the whole person must heal for the gut to function optimally. And now I've just made it my life mission to help other people heal by taking a functional and root cause approach. So, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, I'm glad you went over the whole story because it's I don't know such how an, not to. <laughs> yeah, I know, I'm glad you did because it's such an important story. There's a lot of lessons that we could extract. I, I'm going to just share a few of the lessons that I've learned from your share. Number one, uh, having goals for fitness and performance and bodybuilding, et cetera, is not usually synonymous with having health and longevity goals. As a matter of fact, it's rarely synonymous with that because that lifestyle is very inflammatory. If we look at the last three years with COVID, for example, I saw a lot of bodybuilders and a lot of these CrossFit athletes get really sick and some of them even died from COVID because they were just so internally inflamed, even though they looked incredible on the outside. Yeah. You can't just judge a book by the cover. Now, with that being said, of course, we can have it all. We could look really great and fit and also be healthy, but usually it's not about the health. And that's, that was the case for you. The other lesson was these doctors, you're so right. They're not asking you about your sleep and your uh, mindset and the foods you're eating. Like if they would have just asked you those simple questions, they would have uncovered, like you're having all these artificial sweeteners. You're in a caloric deficit. That's why the thyroid is slowing down. Your basal oh, my body actually I mean, that was that 12% body fat. I was like, yeah, hmm, maybe there's a connection between right. girl, but I don't know. Right. I don't know. And, and when you're in it, it's, it's really hard to yes. see what's happening with yourself. Hey, I want to just briefly interrupt the video you're watching to share something with you. One of my favorite companies that I use for health and longevity and biohacking is a company called Bond Charge. And they have a whole range of incredible products, including the blue light blocking glasses you see me wear right now. But one of my favorite products from them is an infrared sauna blanket. That's right. Uh, you don't have to spend a ton of money investing in a sauna or spending so much time driving to a facility with the sauna. They actually created a sauna blanket that you could use in the comfort of your own home. And I use this all the time. Why would we want to even do a sauna? Well, there's a lot of research and a lot of studies showing the benefits of infrared sauna. The sauna blanket works by raising your heart rate to a workout or a training session. So you burn more calories while you're actually lying down and relaxing. You could burn up to 600 calories in one single session. Also, it's going to cause you to sweat. And one method of flushing out toxins from your body is through sweat. There's also one of my favorite benefits, this endorphin release, endorphin rush you get from using a sauna blanket. And I, every time I get out of the sauna blanket, I feel like I just got a 60-minute massage. And uh, that's because of the endorphin benefit from it. So how this works differently than a regular sauna is that it works by using infrared light, which heats the body directly rather than the air around you like a traditional sauna. This means you get the same benefit at a lower heat. So it's easy to set up. It's super convenient. 30 to 40 minutes uh, will suffice in terms of the length of the sessions. And you do that two to three times a week, you're going to feel amazing. Add that to your keto fasting protocol and watch what it does for your results. You could do it while you watch TV. You could do it while you read a book. I do it while I listen to an audio book. So if you want to learn more about the Bond Charge products, including the sauna blanket, head over to bondcharge.com 
slash keto camp. And if you use the coupon code keto camp at checkout, you'll get 15% off your sauna blanket. And actually any of their products are 15% off with that code. Bond charge hooked you up. So head over to that domain or click the link down below and go get your bond charge products. All right, let's get back to today's video. Yeah, and exactly. You didn't know any, that was the current level of your awareness. And for so many people, that's the case for them. And that's why these conversations conversations are so important, Rachel, because it helps them have those light bulb moments so they could understand, okay, maybe this is not the right approach that they're doing with their doctor. But, you know, you didn't have your menstrual cycle. That is also a red flag. You know, 12% body fat for a female, very, very low. You probably looked phenomenal and you were super ripped and you had your six pack abs, <laughs> which is great, but it's like, you didn't feel great. Yeah. And that is more important than anything. Like just thinking about you being in bed and like wanting to like, just do anything possible to just feel better. Yeah. So many people feel that way and they go down, down that route. And I'm grateful you did not I'm grateful that you kind of paused and then put your faith in the human body and explore that route of, okay, let me just study gut health. And it turned into this whole business and program and all the cool things you're doing now. But let's um, relate what you went through to what I see in the keto space and the carnivore space, specifically with gut issues. Mm -hmm. I see a lot of people who start keto. Let's say they've been low fat for a very long time because that was like the traditional dogma. And they start increasing their fat because they're doing keto and they're getting uh, loose stools. So they're getting diarrhea. They're feeling really awful. Uh, their digestive system symptoms are just manifesting that first day they start incorporating healthy fats. What's the relationship there between dietary fat and the fact that they've been low fat for so long and the liver maybe not being able to um, pump out enough bile to break down that fat? Yeah, you know, we see this quite a bit, especially since we run microbiome testing on all of our clients. And very often when someone switches from, let's just even say like the standard American diet, mm -hmm right? And they switch to a whole food space diet or adding in more healthy fats. They actually find that their digestive issues get worse. And they're like, hey, I felt better actually eating the white breads and the processed foods. And I'm now experiencing a lot of these digestive issues, especially let's say they're keto and they're still eating a decent amount of non-starchy vegetables and fiber, where maybe that wasn't a big part of their diet there before. And there, there's two parts to this, and I want to comment on the liver part, mm -hmm. but I also want to comment on just like the big dietary shift part of it all. And very often when we're eating the standard American diet, which over, I think it's 30%, 36% uh, of the calories coming from inflammatory fats, sugar, and processed foods that are very calorie dense, but nutrient poor, what actually we see happen with the gut microbiome is we see very low diversity. Mm. So diversity is something we look out for overall health just in general, but of course the health of the gut and diversity is the different types of individual bacteria you have in your gut. So they've shown that the more diverse your microbiome, the better metabolic health outcomes, mental health outcomes, just overall health outcomes. And then the less diverse your gut microbiome is, the higher the connection with insulin resistance, metabolic issues, neurodegenerative disorders, you know, type two diabetes, the list goes on and on. So we want a very diverse gut, but when someone's on the standard American diet and very simple carbohydrates, processed foods, we see low diversity, but we also see a lot of bacteria overgrowth of more pathogenic or inflammatory producing bacteria. These are gram negative bacteria um, they produce these lipopolysaccharides, LPS type producing bacteria that causes inflammation. So when somebody now switches and their bacteria or microbiome is comprised of inflammatory bacteria, maybe some gut pathogens in, has a very low diversity, and then they start eating very, very healthy, very often they don't have the bacteria that they need in their gut to break down and digest a lot of those healthy foods. So these can be healthy fats. This can be very often fiber. I think that's what most people find that they struggle with is they start to add in actually healthy foods. I'm adding in broccoli and asparagus and all of these veggies. And they maybe even went low carb or keto where you can eat some of those types of uh, veggies because you can stay still lower carb on them. 
and they start to get very, very bloated. And what's actually happening, right, is the bacteria are fermenting on a lot of those carbohydrates and they don't have a healthy microbiome. So sometimes it's a slow transition into it because we can see that happen quite a bit, but it's not the food that's the problem. It's typically the microbiome and where your gut is at based off of the diet that you've been eating before. And that makes sense. So, so before you get to the liver part, um, so you, the solution is to ease into the transition. Um, is there anything that you would also recommend and take to help with that transition, maybe prebiotics or a rotation of probiotics, or is it the name of the game, slow transition or incorporate these different foods slowly, let your microbiome ad adapt and adjust? Yeah, I think first it is going to be a slower transition into adding in some of these foods. So let's just say you haven't had a whole lot of fiber in your diet and you've been out like, I don't know, naturally five grams per day. You just kind of get some sneaky fiber here and there based off of what you're eating. The whole wheat burger, maybe. Yeah, the whole wheat burger, right? <laughs> and then you all of a sudden go to 25 grams of fiber per day, per day or 30 grams of fiber. Like that's gonna be really tough on your gut. So you can yeah. slowly add in fiber over time, adding in more of these veggies over time. And then also too, same thing with like fats. Um, you can slowly kind of test and add in fats. And that'll actually, I, I think can be beneficial too, based off of the liver side. If you're not used to a very high fat diet, you can kind of ease your way into doing a higher fat diet. Um, because part two of this that we see happen quite a bit is people's bile actually gets very, very backed up. And we need bile to help break down and absorb fats. And for a lot of people who have poor gut health, they've eaten the same thing, very processed food-based diet, their body doesn't naturally produce now a lot of the enzymes that it needs to break down these good, healthy foods. And then they can even develop some digestive insufficiency and even a food intolerance based off of this. Now, a food intolerance is very different than a food sensitivity and even a food allergy, it's usually based off of low digestive enzymes. Mm -hmm. So for somebody who's not tolerating a lot of fats, you can actually support the gallbladder. Um, you can support it through bitters. Bitters is something that we use quite a bit with our clients. Um, there's natural bitters in foods. So arugula is actually a, a natural bitter that I have in my diet every single day. It helps the body produce more digestive enzymes and, and bile. And you can also do apple cider vinegar. So, you know, that's a big one people talk about. Is that beneficial for health or is that a hype? Well, it is actually great um, because it does help your body produce more of these, these enzymes that it needs. Um, so you can also supplement too. So some people will actually take um, uh, some ox bile or some hydrochloric acid too. Yeah. And both of these can be beneficial, but I think easing into it a little bit, paying attention to your body, not looking at it like a light switch. But if you do notice you start to get a lot of bloating and GI issues, it's more than likely digestive insufficiency that's happening there, which can be fixed or microbiome imbalances. Great breakdown. Yeah, I love bitters. I always say bitters for the liver. It's, uh, it's so important. So arugula, like, as you mentioned, apple cider vinegar, dandelion uh, greens and milk thistle, et cetera, lemons and limes, all that is terrific. Uh, so many people have beat up their liver from medications and toxins, et cetera. So now they're eating more fat to your point, Rachel, they can't break it down. And they're thinking this keto thing is not working for me, but it's not the keto. That's the issue. It's the fact that you're not just producing healthy bile. You got thick sluggish bile. So there's some things you can do and the liver will adapt. The liver is amazing. I call the liver, the soccer mom organ because it does so many things for us. So slow transition, bitters, and then you mentioned hydrochloric acid. Um, I know that a lot of people believe, well, maybe not in our space, but conventional wisdom is like acid reflux and GERD is a result of too much stomach acid. So they take things like Tums and these antacids, terrible which, yeah, which I want you to talk about why it's terrible, which suppresses stomach acid. And then later on, when you try to eat more protein and fat, we can't break it down. So what's happening there? What's the myth around uh, acid reflux and GERD? Yeah, I, I see a lot of people recommending that they're like, I have an acid problem, I have an acid problem. And they end up taking things like Tums and all of that, which does get rid of a lot of the stomach acid. But very rarely does somebody have too much acid production 
it's actually more common that someone is not producing enough stomach acid overall. Um, yep. Very rarely have I seen that on our microbiome test where somebody is producing way too much. But what actually happens, especially with protein, when you eat protein, you know, and hydrochloric acid helps break down protein in the stomach and you don't have the enzymes that are needed to break it down, that protein can actually begin to rot and create more of a reflux. Yeah, a re, a re what? <laughs> a reflux like symptom. I don't know if we're gonna leave that in. <laughs> <laughs> we should leave it in there. It is kind of like a reflux because you're like, oh, my, it it could be. I, uh, yeah, <laughs> it can be more of a reflux like symptom overall. So, um, actually, sometimes when you can supplement with HCL, it even helps with some of that acid reflux like symptoms. Yeah. So that's, you know, if you find, I always like when I ask my students, what are you noticing with your digestive symptoms? And they're telling me, well, I, I eat like a steak or I eat protein and it kind of just sits in the gut, usually a sign of uh, too low stomach acid. I have a theory that I haven't proven and I haven't seen research, but I'm going to share it with you and want, I want to hear your thoughts on it. Um, and it might be a controversial one because it's very popular for people to drink a lot of alkaline water, like Kangen. They always reach out to me. I've never worked with them, but um, can, I mean, alkaline water is not natural. These machines are turning the water alkaline and it's really high pH. It's, it's, the gut is very acidic. My theory is this, and I, I don't know if this is true, but I've seen this just from case studies and students. If somebody's drinking high alkaline water every day for years, will it potentially lower stomach acid? Can it be that powerful to lower, lower stomach acid? I'm thinking it can, but I haven't proven it. What are your thoughts? That's a really good theory and question. You know, I don't know. I, I feel like it, it definitely could, it, especially if we're eating something that's more alkaline and then our stomach's very acidic, you know, would it like neutralize between the two of them? Yeah, I'm thinking like if you're drinking it all day and it's a very high pH, your stomach is very acidic, over time, can it change things where you're going to have trouble? It's going to lower your stomach acid. Does it have that effect? I don't know. I, I would think it would, but I asked Dr. Vincent Pedre this question, the, the uh, happy gut guy. He has a new book and he says, no, it's not powerful enough to do that. But I don't know. I don't, I don't really believe that. I think it does eventually can do that. So I, I don't see know. you do a study and prove that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would like to see a study on that. Anyways, it's just a thought. I wanted to hear your thoughts well, on that. And, and also, you know, one last thing about the stomach acid is, you know, we see a lot of people who get on things like PPIs, proton pump inhibitors uh -huh. and antacids, and they actually end up with a ton of bacteria overgrowth and dysbiosis. So there is a connection between PPIs, getting rid of stomach acid and bacteria overgrowth in the gut. And I've worked with a lot of these people. There's a ton of studies out there. I can't quote anyone in particular off the top of my head. But if you Google PPIs and SIBO, small intestinal bacteria overgrowth, there's a lot of studies to back up that proton pump inhibitors by the lowering of stomach acid does actually contribute to bacterial overgrowth because we need that acidity to actually kill off a, a lot of bacteria and pathogens that also enter into our body. So it's also a, a frontline defense that we need for pathogens. And if you think about it, every time we're eating, we are literally taking things from the outside world, which have a ton of bacteria and there's pathogens. There's, we live in a very toxic world and we put it into our body. And then our body does its job to fight off the things that are not supposed to be there. And so when we cut off our stomach acid, which is a first line defense, this can actually lead to more bacteria overgrowth. It makes sense. That's what happened to you, right? With your, um, SIBO? Is that part of what happened with you? I was never on a, a proton pump inhibitor, okay. um, but I think for me more so the, the low motility because one of the main root causes for SIBO is dysmotility. So very often in SIBO protocols, they'll put people on motility agents. Um, ginger is a great motility agent. Sometimes they'll actually do um, medications like erythromycin and microdose can sometimes be a type of a motility agent. But the number one cause for relapse outside of not changing your lifestyle and still eating the shitty diet and all that is poor motility because we have this migrating motor complex, the MMC, which are these cleaning waves that sweep throughout our GI tract that actually reach peak activity 
around three to four hours in between meals, so in fasting periods. And when somebody is snacking quite a bit, or they have, let's just say, some kind of a motility issue, because you can have that, um, stress can also negatively impact motility. Um, we know the gut brain connection is, is pretty big. Um, you know, people who are anorexic or under eating that can negatively affect motility, low thyroid, hypothyroidism, right? It slows everything down, but we need these cleaning waves because they are wiping bacteria, toxins, you know, to the lower part of our GI tract. And when that stops happening, when that is interfered, one constantly eating throughout the day, which actually a lot of bodybuilders do, right? They're like, I yeah. need six to eight meals throughout the day to maintain this inhumane amount of muscle and because i got to keep my metabolism going um, or if it's interrupted from stress or lifestyle or diet choices this is actually one of the main causes in um, SIBO and where i feel like a lot of people really struggle to heal is a lot of their dysmotility does come from their lifestyle and stress and they don't really heal a lot of that and they they feel better for a period of time they get on the antibiotics the zafaxin the neomycin which are very common protocols that are given or maybe they even do more of a functional medicine approach they do more of an herbal approach and then they relapse because their motility wasn't really healed based off of getting to the key root causes of lifestyle Interesting. So the migrating motor complexes, is, you, you said after three or four hours after you're finishing, you're done with the meal, usually it activates the uh, migrating motor complex and it's starting to sweep out some of the, some of the trash, but it's, it sounds like it's very sensitive, like a, like a, like a kitten, right? Uh, you make too much noise, too much stress, or you eat again and it, and it goes into hiding is what you're saying. Yeah. So whenever you're in a fasting period, was, especially during night, if you think about it, that is when we get most of the MMC activity taking place. So for people who are snacking throughout the day, that impacts our, which we do get motility, but not the migrating motor complex, like the cleaning waves type motility that's taking place. Like we get peristalsis um, as we're digesting food, but we're not getting the MMC type activity, but also the gut and the brain are interconnected through the vagus nerve. So when you're in a sympathetic state, chronically, not acute, right? Acute stress is good. Um, we want acute stress. So that's like me getting in my ice bath. That's me doing you know, yeah. a really tough workout and the body actually rebuilds itself back up stronger, which also you're not digesting during that time. Like your, your body's not focusing on digestion or any of that. But when stress becomes chronic, which it was for me, with my training and just being at a low body composition in general, your cortisol is, is chronically elevated quite a bit because your blood sugar is so chronically low. Like I would get blood sugar drops all the time. I get shaky and get anxiety when I was at that low of a body composition because I just didn't have a whole lot of reserves. Mm -hmm. And um, what happens is when your blood sugar drops, uh, your cortisol spikes, right? Because it's a glucocorticoid. So for a lot of people who have blood sugar imbalances, they also notice high anxiety, high stress. Um, but for me, I, my cortisol was always elevated. I remember even getting my blood test done and the doctor was like, whoa, your cortisol is at like 40. He's like, I've never seen someone's cortisol so high. And he's like, also, how are you lean? Um, with cortisol <laughs> so high? Because we tend to associate, you know, cortisol with, you know, someone who gains weight because cortisol, yeah. right? But we have to look at the full picture always. It's not like your cortisol is high. Yes, it can definitely play a role. Um, but for me, it was chronically elevated. And I also believe that that played a role in my gut because, it's catabolic. Cortisol breaks things down. Bodybuilders avoid it like the hawk, right? Because they don't want to break down their muscle tissue when it's, when it's elevated. So that is why when they're so lean, also they do eat quite a bit because it, it can help take them out of a catabolic state, um, especially when they're getting a lot of protein, adding in amino acids that can definitely help. But we don't often think that about how our gut lining is also a muscle tissue and very easily broken down one cell layer thick. And when we're in that catabolic state, the gut lining breaks down, leads to intestinal permeability, which also sets the tone for further dysbiosis, gut issues, neurological issues too. Yeah. It's just a cascade. Um, that's why it starts with the gut. That's your, what you always talk about. 
What is your curious? What's your body fat percentage at, at this moment? Do you know? I, I don't test that much. I do have an in body in my garage. If you don't know what that is, it's a biologic yeah. impedance analysis. I had one in my practice. And then now that we're fully virtual, I just have it in my home gym here. But I think last time I test, I was close to 20, 20%. 20%? Yeah. And I, I still have six pack abs. Like, you do. Yeah. If anybody follows Rachel on uh, Instagram, she's got great abs. Um, great abs. So what is, what would be not a fitness range for women in general? What would be a healthy range, an optimal range for women to, to aim for, for body fat percentage? You know, what is healthy for each woman will of course vary based off of their body. I've known some women who can get to close to 16% body fat, no issues whatsoever. And I'm actually one of those people too. I can get to 16%. I'm not at 16% right now, but I can get to 16% body fat and have a very normal menstrual cycle, um, like my body composition, no blood sugar issues, no gut issues and do okay. There are some women who they get to 16% body fat or maybe even just a little bit lower, 14%. And they do start to develop issues. They start to lose their menstrual cycle. They start to have more blood sugar issues um, and it does negatively affect their body. So it really does depend on each person. Um, I, I'm lucky in terms of I can get, but for me, 12% body fat was way, way, way too low. I think even at one point I got down to 10 accidentally. Mm. Um, just training hard and never changing my regimen. Um, but overall, to answer your question, I think most women, it falls between around maybe 16, but 18%, probably up to 23% would be the ideal range where you will, you will love your body composition there. Hey, I want to just interrupt the video watching real quick to share something with you. As somebody who's been in the keto space for 14 years, I've taken thousands and thousands of people through a keto protocol. I've seen the number one problem and struggle people have on keto being this electrolyte dumping process. Allow me to explain real quick. When you lower your carbohydrates and lower insulin, you're going to release excess water weight, which is terrific because you're going to look lighter, less puffy, and feel lighter. The problem is this, the kidneys also release excess electrolytes and you go through this sort of diuresis process leading to symptoms on keto. And what is the solution? Keeping your electrolytes up. And when I talk about electrolytes, there are good ones out there, then there are optimal, incredible products. The one that I use is from Upgraded Charge. One of the reasons why I love this product that it has a unique proprietary blend of nanoparticles that have the ability to get into your cells, which is for maximum absorption. It contains magnesium, zinc, sodium, and potassium. And it tastes pretty good. Kind of tastes like a non-alcoholic margarita. And the flavor comes from the lemon peel. Simply use this by adding it to your water or sparkling water and get your electrolytes up. Replenish them. This is key to feeling incredible on keto. Upgraded Formulas has hooked you all up with a sweet deal to get their upgraded charge or any of their amazing products at 15% off. All you need to do is head over to upgradedformulas.com and use the coupon code KETOCAMP at checkout and get 15% off your entire order. I will drop a link for you with the coupon code in the notes down below. All right, let's get back to this video. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's very different for women than men. Like a lot of people have that number in their mind and they think like, oh, that's not that low. Like that's not that low. I want to be much lower. But you also have to remember as women, we have extra fat around our ovaries. We have extra fat around our breast tissue. And visually looking at this, a, a woman probably close to 16 or 18% is going to look like a guy who's probably closer to like 10 to 12% mm -hmm. visually. And that's Correct. why for me, you know, at 20%, I can still actually have six pack abs, but I also store a lot more of my fat in the lower part of my body. So I store it more in my, my butt, my hips and thighs. Yeah. Most Reproduction. Yeah, reproduction, right? And for most women, when they're in their reproductive years, they store more fat in that area, which is very, very healthy. It's more of that pear shape. Where for men, they tend to store more of their fat around the midsection. And that fat around the midsection is actually what's the most metabolically unhealthy 
um, because it can lead to things like insulin resistance more likely, but women who will go into their menopausal years will start to see a shift. They'll start to see a shift when they're not in that reproductive years and they'll start to actually get more fat around the mid midsection and less looking like the pear and more like an apple. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there you go. Go tech test your body fat and see where you're at. That's arguably even more important than the, the number on the scale, the weight. Yeah. Um, I want to, I want to ask you about antibiotics. How many times do you have clients that come into your, your program and you find out they've, you know, recently taken antibiotics. What do you, how, how do you coach them on that? Like, how do you explain what antibiotics have done to them? And then how do you rebuild some of the things that have been lost with antibiotics? Yeah. So we always do a pretty in-depth history of everybody when they come in, medications they've on, previous medications, birth control, you know, I can dive into that too. And like that's negative effect on the microbiome, antibiotic use, getting to know their diet, the supplements that they take. But yeah, antibiotics is on there in particular because of its negative effect on the microbiome. Now, if you do one round of antibiotics, is this just going to ruin your health 100%? Like, like, probably not. However, it does play a big role in shifting your microbiome. Um, unfortunately, you know, there are different times in our life where we do have to get on antibiotics. I've been on antibiotics before. And I'm never to tell anybody not to get antibiotics because antibiotics can save your life in a lot of Correct. scenarios. Yeah. Um, like I had a client reach out to me and she was like, hey, I'm getting surgery. They want me to get on antibiotics. Should I get on antibiotics? And I'm like, you know, yes, you, mm -hmm. you should get on antibiotics because you know what? If you get an infection after your surgery, that's going to be far worse then what would happen then some of the shifts that take place with your microbiome. However, we don't want to overly get on antibiotics. And I think that's what we see quite a bit is, you know, we see kids who have all these ear infections when they're younger and they're on rounds and rounds and rounds of antibiotics. Or, you know, we see people when they're in their teenage years, they have acne and the number one therapy that was used for acne in dermatology was antibiotics. You know, I was put on erythromycin myself for acne. I was, I can't even remember all of the antibiotics that I was put on for acne because they had the theory that acne was really due to bacteria overgrowth in the skin. Um, and we've actually now shown that the microbiome plays such a huge role in skin health and things like acne, of course, hormones do as well. But why are our hormones off? Your gut can play a massive role. Of course, your diet. And I even remember too, I had a dermatologist when I was younger. I was like, does, does the food you eat play any impact in your skin? I was like looking for affirmation that I could eat whatever I wanted <laughs> and it wouldn't impact because I had terrible cystic acne growing up. Um, I was put on Accutane even. That's why I, I totally get it. I was on all the gut destroyers, but the physician was like, no, there's nothing that shows that the food that you eat wow. affects your skin. And They're I still saying that to this day. I know. And I left and I was like, oh, awesome. I can still eat my McDonald's and French fries and it's not going to just pimples galore. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Oh. Um, yeah. But to answer your question um, about antibiotics, yeah, antibiotics will definitely wipe out a lot of the good bacteria in your gut. And where this can become problematic is because when we wipe out a lot of the good and some bad, sometimes bacteria, it can allow for other bacteria to overgrow because a lot of our good probiotics, bifidobacterium and lactobacilli, they actually work as a line of defense for gut pathogens. So I see a lot of women actually develop um, candida overgrowth or yeast infections after they go on a round of antibiotics. And they're like, wait, how did this happen? Well, what happened is you actually already had some of this yeast in your body and in your gut. And then you went on a round of antibiotics and you wiped out a lot of your good bacteria. And now this set a train where a lot of this yeast could actually overgrow. And then they had a candida infection or they have a yeast infection and then they have to get on antifungals. So avoiding them, you know, if we can is always the goal, but sometimes we do need to bite the bullet and get on an antibiotic. It's just weighing out what is the, going to be the bigger pain and issue. 
Now, if you have been on antibiotics, there are definitely some things that you can do to support your microbiome before and getting off. Um, I like to do some good gut lining support when you're on antibiotics. So supporting with L-glutamine, aloe vera, um, colostrum can actually be really beneficial with um, immunoglobulins. Um, a lot of this supports the immune and inflammatory response in your gut. It, it supports the gastric mucosa of the gut lining, which is what we oftentimes see damaged also as a byproduct of getting on antibiotics. And when we see the mucosa damaged, this also is what can create more of bacterial overgrowth, food sensitivities. So one, supporting the gut lining. Um, two, I'd say you can support with probiotics. Now, I've talked to so many different gastroenterologists and there's so many different theories about probiotics out there. You know, I've had Dr. Kenneth Brown on my podcast. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. Yeah. You know, and he really is not huge on probiotics unless they are a spore-based probiotic in particular. And one of the things that he says is, you know, if most probiotics have to be refrigerated and going back to our stomach acid conversation, what makes you think that this probiotic that has to stay at this certain low temperature is actually going to survive your body temperature and the acidity and all of that that's in your body? However, uh, he's a big fan of spore-based probiotics. I can probably not explain spore-based probiotics as well as he can, but essentially, um, I hope I explained this right, but how the, these probiotics work is they produce a, a spore um, and it's actually more protective for that probiotic, that bacteria, so it's able to make it to the part of the GI tract that it's needed. Now, a lot of other gastroenterologists or functional medicine physicians just totally believe in probiotics um, and that they, they are beneficial when getting on different antibiotic protocols. So I, I feel like there's no harm in it. You know, I'd say support your body with some good probiotics. You can also get them from food-based sources. Um, most of the time, probiotics don't actually work by colonizing to your gut. They more so have a transitory benefit meaning as they are moving throughout your stomach, your small intestine, and your large intestine, if it makes it all that way there, um, they have benefits in terms of fighting off a lot of bad bacteria. So they still can keep at bay, you know, yeast overgrowth and things like that. But the main thing you're gonna wanna do to rebuild your microbiome back up after is gonna be focusing primarily on diet, getting an abundance of, you know, prebiotics, um, you can do some fermented foods, mm -hmm. kef kefir, if you, if you tolerate dairy, um, sauerkraut, kimchi. Um, you can do a lot of polyphenols too in your diet. So polyphenols are what give fruits and vegetables their bright colors. Matcha green tea is a polyphenol, dark chocolate. So I always have dark chocolate in my diet. <laughs> um, you know, purple, sweet potato, um, all of the bright colored fruits and vegetables are high in polyphenols, curcumin, quercetin. Um, they've actually been shown to even work a bit more effectively than some probiotics just because they help the body um, produce more good bacteria, more like a prebiotic than an actual probiotic that has to survive through your your stomach acid and then your body temperature too. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. You know, probiotics are, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. And I think, I do think in general, they are overhyped, meaning yeah. people think you could just fix your gut by taking a probiotic. And you know, Rachel, that is not true. It's like a drop the way in that the I, ocean. Yeah. Say that again? I said, it's like a drop in the ocean. Exactly. It's a small drop in the ocean. There's so many other things going on. But there is a time and place for them. Uh, the way that I, I personally use it and what I teach my students is we rotate different probiotics. So sometimes we'll do a spore. We'll do like mega spore and then we'll rotate to a different one and then we'll eat more prebiotics. And I just like changing things up in the rotation more than just staying on one probiotic, probiotic forever and not doing all the other stuff. Yeah. So two more, two more things here before we wrap it up. Um, staying on the topic of the gut and then we're going to transition to a different topic to wrap things up. You, you told me something before we hit record, and I want you to share that quote about anxiety and psych, psychiatric patients and the, the correlation there. 
Yeah, this study was done by the American Psychological Association, and it says that the average young adult has the same level of anxiety as a psychiatric patient did in the 1950s. Jeez, and that's awful. It, it, it's insane. It, it blows my mind, and it also blows my mind that we're not asking the question, why? Right? You and I are all about getting to the root cause. It's a, it's a medication deficiency, isn't it? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you just need to get on another SSRI and right? yeah, that's all it. your issues. And, and that's what's so unfortunate is because that's how our health industry or you what you call and I love it sick industry really addresses, you know, health. You come in with a symptom, you have depression, anxiety, and we basically diagnose based off of symptom clusters. Not basically, we do diagnose based off of symptom clusters. We say, hmm, you fit all of the criteria for major depressive disorder. You fit all the criteria for, you know, anxiety disorder. So here's a medication that can help you. Now, I'm not against ever taking the pill. You know, I'm not against it. I think for some people, it can be the little push that they need, you know, especially if they're, they're massively depressed and they can't get out of bed. Um, what I think that's so wrong with, you know, traditional psychiatry is they also don't ask about those other areas. They also don't ask about the root causes as to why you may be struggling with anxiety and depression in the first place. They just only give you a pill. That is it. That is their solution to helping you get healthy, you know, and big pharma last year made over, I forget, four point something trillion dollars just based off of medications. And people don't realize like this is a business. They yeah. are making money off of you, just like every other business Yeah. on getting you on medication. It's a brilliant, it's a brilliant business model, isn't it? It's evil. Yeah. It's kind of evil, but it works really well. Yeah. And I think I said this on the podcast, you came on on mine, but you know, then all of these medications, you know, they have side effects and we actually have to say, do they really have side effects or do they just have effects that we don't market? Mm. Right. We are like, oh, this is all the benefits you're going to get. And then here's the long list of side effects. And are they really side effects? Right. Or are they just the things they don't want to really promote? Um, and I can also speak to this, too, because I was put on an SSRI. I was actually put on one when I was 16 years old, um, Lexapro specifically. I was on it for a good 10 years and my neurotransmitters became adapted to being on this SSRA because what happens is an SSRI actually closes the reuptake of serotonin back into um, back into the, the vessel. And there's this serotonin in this synaptic cleft in, the, in this area. And I won't go too sciencey for people so they understand, but what, there's these enzymes that actually eat up a lot of your serotonin. And what happens then is for a while, people see benefit from getting on these SSRIs, but when they get off of it, when these reuptake transporters are reopened because that medication was keeping them closed, um, they actually have lower levels of serotonin because of those enzymes, like five, um, I think five MEO, or some of the M MEO enzymes actually eat up a lot of these serotonin and now they're actually depleted. And now they're really struggling mentally. And that's what happened for me is I came off of this SSRI and I actually had panic attacks for the first time in my life. And I didn't have panic attacks before I was on the medication. I was in, wow. I was a 16 year old moody teenager, normal stuff, going through puberty, life changes, <laughs> boy issues, mean girls in school. And I was like, I'm depressed. And my mom's like, Oh my gosh, you're going to bring me to the doctor. And they're like, okay, here's a medication. And you know, I trust my doctor. So for me, this has just been like a whole history, like building up to the point where I really went into more or so the functional medicine route and coming off of it was the worst thing ever really dealing with withdrawal symptoms. And, um, I wouldn't wish that on anybody. It was the hardest thing. I could say the hardest thing that I ever have to do. And I honestly will say that it was even harder than my gut issues that I struggled with. Wow. That speaks volumes. It was that hard. I had Andy Frisella on my podcast because he was on even uh, Lexapro. 
and, and on a much higher dose too for I think a good 10 years of his life and he tried to come off of it and he was getting you know tremors and same thing all of these like just a life went to shift and he said to me and Andy Priscilla you know for you guys listening like 75 hard tough guy mm-hmm. that's him he said it was the hardest thing of his entire life wow he ever had to walk through and for him to say that I was like wow one, I don't feel like a big baby anymore <laughs> after trying to come off of it. But I, I wish more people knew that about medication when they're getting on, because once you get on, it is really, really difficult to get off. One, you don't want to talk to a professional if you do want to come off of an antidepressant. If you're on it, it's not something you want to do cold turkey ever, ever, ever. It's something you have to wean very slowly. You also really want to support every other area of your health, right? Which is maybe part of the reason as to why the depression was there in the first place, right? From a functional medicine perspective, you know, we can identify that poor gut health, you know, bacteria dysbiosis, low diversity, intestinal permeability, um, and deficiencies in key micronutrients, B vitamins, uh, poor methylation, hormonal imbalances, you know, low testosterone, high estrogen, low progesterone, um, excess toxins in the body, heavy metals that cross through the blood brain barrier, like the list goes on and on and all the different reasons plurally as to why someone could be struggling with depression, not to mention life situations, life things that you actually walk through, which oftentimes like makes sense. You're like, yeah, I get it. I get why you're, you're struggling. Like when somebody dies in, in your life and like you're depressed, that's a normal level of like, going through life and struggle for me when I was a moody teenager, that was normal. Like that was completely normal, but we want to numb. We want to run away. We're like, I don't want to actually have to feel all of this because it's so uncomfortable. So I just wish that there was more people who looked at the full picture, especially for people who are struggling with mental health issues and also be able to ask those deeper questions. Like talk to me about your exercise, talk to me about your sleep, talk to me about your nutrition. Let's work on some of these things. Let's also work more on, you know, your mental health, the relationships that you have in your life. Let's, let's work a little bit on the relationship you have with yourself and, we can do all of these things and it's, it's incredible, you know, the results that people could be getting and, and avoid getting on some of these medications that are so difficult to get off of. Well said, you know, there's opportunities, opportunities and all those challenges, but sometimes a lot of the time we just ignore them and numb them and get on a medication. And later on, we're looking back and we're like, they're regretting that decision. So well said, that's important. So if you're listening, share the episode with somebody you know who might be dealing with something similar. Uh, two quick questions to land the plane with you. Question one, you're about to hit episode 100 on your podcast. Congratulations, everybody go subscribe to it. Sheer Madness Podcast, available on all podcast platforms and also YouTube. And question is this, have you ever interviewed somebody where you decided not to release the interview? And if that's, yeah, I mean, yes. you don't say the person's name, but why? Ah, uh, um, actually, this happened a couple of months ago, and it's only happened once. I've only had one person ever who came on my show, and she was a registered dietitian. I, I didn't find her. Um, shout out, Becky, my assistant found her <laughs> um, and invited her to come on my show. And just none of the information she gave was accurate or reputable. Yeah. Um, awesome human. Um, was very, very cordial, went through the entire interview. But after the interview, I just sat with it and I was like, you know what, I, I can't, I can't release this. I can't drop it. There was just certain things that I, you know, I can have confrontational debate with people and there was a bit of that, but there's also a level of, you know, when someone's kind of just like blowing shit, <laughs> like blowing smoke up their ass and just like yep. making stuff up on the spot. You know, there were some things that were said like, and I get some dietitians have this approach of there's no such thing as good or bad foods. She's like, there's no good or bad foods. Like it's just, I was like, um, and I said to her, I was like, vegetable oils, seed oils. And I like listed all of these bad foods. And I'm like, you're telling me there's no good or bad foods. And so I think there's a lot of people out there nowadays who want to be the expert, want to be the podcast, you know, do all of that. It's, it's incredible. But 
I think uh, it's created a lot of misinformation out there too. And I'm not to be one of the podcasts that puts that type of information out there. Yeah, that's what, you know, people respect that. I respect that. So, you know, I wasn't, I didn't, Have you? what about me? Yeah. So I'm about to hit 600 episodes and there are two podcasts that I didn't release. Um, actually three. So the first one was simply that it was, um, we recorded the whole thing, but when we went back to do the reproduction of it or the production, I should say, uh, it was going in and out with the audio. So it was not salvageable. So that's just that's whatever that happens. Yeah. The second one was um, actually a gentleman who just passed away, Dr. Rashid Buttar. Do you know who Dr. Buttar is? Are you familiar with him at all? I feel like I do, but I can't. He was, yeah, he was one of the guys that were like one of the pioneers when the COVID happened and the vaccines. He was very much against it. It was a very controversial interview, and it was a fantastic interview. The guy has done so much for freedom of speech. However, uh, my lawyer reviewed the interview before I was going to release it, and he advised me not to because the FDA was like going hard at this guy. They said they were going to come after me, and I had to make a difficult decision not to uh -huh. release it. So I just screened it to like my subscribers on email via Zoom. But the only one that I decided not to post because it wasn't relevant to my audience actually happened a couple months ago too. A gentleman came on who um, – they, his team reached out to me and I saw he did some interviews with some of my colleagues and I started researching him. I thought it could be a good fit, but the energy was very low. I think he was falling asleep, honestly, during the conversation. Like his eyes were like closed. I'm like wondering what's going on. And he was just pushing products and pushing products. And yeah. after the conversation was done, I'm like, I, I can't really release, release this. It's going to do my audience a big disservice. So I decided never to release it. Um, did that, per that woman, the dietitian ever ask you about the episode? She didn't. I think she probably picked up my vibe, which I'm, I'm a kind person. So, you know, I, yeah. I held space for her and Same. it was more when I just sat with it after I was like, you know, I just like, didn't feel right. Now someone did suggest that I do release the episode, but I do like, I blot out the person's face and I do change the voice and I don't put a name out there, but I make a commentary on it where I say, okay, this is why this is wrong. And I was like, oh, that would actually be really good to do. But oh man, if she saw that, I would yeah. feel so bad. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. It would be a good idea in terms of like, it probably would do well, but it would probably make her feel really awful. Yeah. <laughs> uh, last quick question, vitamin G, gratitude. I talk a lot about vitamin G. I got to send you a shirt too, by the way. Yeah, one. Uh, yeah, vitamin G shirt. Sure, I'll get you one. What are you grateful for right now, Rachel? <sighs> I'm grateful for all of life and the ability to create, honestly. Um, you know, something I talk about recently in, in my work currently is abundance. And I'm all for abundance. And I feel like that goes hand in hand with gratitude. I say abundance really is presence in what you're doing combined with gratitude for all of life. And that's when we are living in abundance. It's not something that we get to. It's not something that we strive for, but it's a place that we operate from. It's when we're mm -hmm. fully present in what we're doing and we're grateful for what is around us in our life and for everything that we have. Um, for me, like I'm, I'm in an incredible place in my life, you know, health wise, I'm, I'm doing great. I have a business that I get to make a massive impact in. Um, that I get to serve that also serves me back every single moment that I'm excited about. I'm, I'm grateful for a, a new community that I've started uh, mastermind helping actually health fitness entrepreneurs, women in particular um, on their entrepreneurial journey who have gone through very similar things in their life, want to take their story, the things that they've walked through, turn it upward and help other people. That's why I call it the evolution because I think a lot of us can relate to that. Like we go through something in our life, you know, you have been in, in your life with like all the weight that you lost and finding keto and you were like, oh my gosh, what was the worst thing that happened to me has become one of the best things. And I want to help other people do this too. I want to help other people through what I was able to do for myself because more people need to know about this. And I think mm -hmm. that is the most incredible feeling ever. Like that is the work that we all are after in our life. And we spend so much of our time in our work, like so much of our time. So to be able to step into doing something that has been such a huge part of you in your healing journey, but then be able to help other people, like that's something I'm just grateful for every single day and to help now other entrepreneurs do the exact same thing. 
Very cool. Yeah, that's something definitely to be grateful for. I love the abundance mindset. I, I really believe abundance is our, our birthright. I'm grateful for you, Rachel. I've got a lot of vitamin G for you and our several collaborations. We'll do a lot more. So cheers to that. What, where is the best place to check you out? RachelShear.com, um, Sheer Madness Podcast, anywhere else? Yeah, Instagram, Rachel Shear. Practice is Rachel Shear Nutrition. And yeah, you said it. All that good stuff. We'll put it down below. Thank you, Rachel, for coming back to the show. Thank you, guys.